some secrets out. I think Harvest is a great secret that's been kept a secret for too long. Amen? Uh, it's good to be with you guys. So for those of you who I haven't met before, my name's Peter, and uh, I'm a pastor of the River Christian Church in Pakaranga, and uh, I've become great friends with Pastor Stan. In fact, Pastor Stan and a few others. Uh, some guys that you might know, uh, Pastor Wayne Pete. Anybody know Pastor Wayne? And Pastor Jason Smith. I think they might have been speaking here. Yeah? So we're all part of a group. We get together each Wednesday and we pray for each other. And we pray for the churches because I tell you what, man, God is doing something amazing in the church at the moment. He really is. Right across the world, people are waking up to the reality of who God is. You know, and you know, the world will sometimes, the media sometimes says, you know, Christianity is getting smaller. People are leaving church. I tell you, that's a lie, man. That's the church of God is advancing. Yeah. It's yeah. going from strength to strength and glory to glory. And I tell you, in these days, man, this is such an exciting time to be alive. Yes. It really is. You know, some people say, I want to be alive back when Jesus walked the earth. I tell you what, you want to be alive right now. Amen. You want to be alive in this day and in this time. Why? Because the Bible says that the glory on the last house is going to be greater than the glory on the first house. There's greater glory that's coming upon us. And I so love the time of worship tonight. Wasn't that great to get into the time of worship? Yeah. Just love the, the worshipers. And I'm just wondering, actually, before I get into some stuff tonight, if I can actually just pray. Can I get those worship team? If you're part of the worship team here, if, can I just get you just to come stand up? In this area here, if you're part of the worship, even if you weren't up tonight, if you're usually part of the worship team here, just come and just come and stand up, stand up here. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Just yeah, any, anyone who's part of the worship team here, that's awesome. And if you just 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 kind of uh, just stand in front of me here, yeah, that's right. Just um, just close your eyes and lift your hands up to the Lord, because I actually really felt like tonight that the Lord was going to start to do something really new in your whole area of worship. You know, there was just a, a fresh, you know, the Bible talks about an anointing. And what anointing is, is when God empowers you to do something that you couldn't naturally do. You know, and, and he takes your natural skill and ability. And I think we've seen some skill and ability from these guys, eh? Aren't they amazing? They're great musicians. But what God wants to do is he wants to take his spirit. And he wants to descend the spirit upon you. And there's like a whole other level that your worship's going to go to. So why don't we just start to pray? Harvest Church, why don't you start to pray? Reach out to these guys tonight. And Father, we just thank you tonight, Lord God, for what you're doing in Harvest Church. And we thank you tonight specifically for this area of worship, Lord. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I just thank you, Lord, for a whole new anointing coming upon these guys as they lead the church in worship. Lord, even over this camp, Lord God, they've been starting to go to another level. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for the sounds of heaven to invade earth. Lord, we thank you, God, for the sounds of angels singing along, Lord, as they worship. And Father, I just thank you, God, for new songs. Lord, you're going to release songs on these ones. Lord, they've been singing songs from other people. God, but I thank you, Lord, increasingly they're going to sing songs that you have laid upon their hearts. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we just ask for the anointing to come upon them tonight to go to a whole other level and worship. I'm just going to lay my hands on you. I really believe that the presence of God is here. I can just really feel, you know, as I was driving down here tonight, I could just so sense the presence of God upon this place, you know. And I just know that the Lord's going to touch some of your lives tonight. And so I just thank you, Lord, even right now. We just release whoo, the anointing of God. Thank you, God. Whoo, the anointing of God. Right now, whoo, fresh anointing. Fresh anointing for worship right now. Whew, fresh anointing for worship right now. Whew, fresh anointing. Fresh anointing for worship. Oh, yes, God. Ha, whoa. Ha, whew, fresh anointing for worship tonight. Fresh anointing. Fresh anointing right now in Jesus' name. And you know what? You don't have to have fallen over or anything to receive an anointing from God. Let me tell you a little story. This is for everybody in the room. Many years ago. I was in a meeting, and there was a guy in this meeting, and his name was called Ruckins McKinley. You've probably never heard of him. But yeah, have you? Yeah. Yeah, Michael Jackson's backup dancer guy. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you what, man, he's amazing, because he'll preach, and he'll say, can I bust a move? And everyone goes, yeah. And he goes, you know, like, he does it, you know, I can't. But like, he can dance and stuff, and then he'll rap, and he'll sing, and he does all this stuff. Anyway, I was sitting there in the meeting, and he said, hey, I want to pray for people. I got up the front of the meeting, and he laid hands on me, and you know what? I didn't feel anything. But you know what? I went home that night and I found that I actually had the ability from that moment on to be able to orchestrate music. 
Like, I, I've always been a musician, but I was able to actually, I wrote an entire musical after that night, and I was able to hear horn parts, brass parts, string parts, everything, wow. and do it all at once. I'd never been able to do it before, but when he laid hands on me, an anointing came from heaven, and it touched my life. I felt nothing in the meeting, but something changed in my life. So I'm speaking that right over you guys tonight in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord God, that right over each one of these ones tonight, Lord, even through the simple laying on of hands right now, Lord, we thank you, God, that stuff is getting imparted into your spirit right now. Lord, the ability to lead worship, the ability to worship on a whole new level, the ability for songs, the ability for music, the ability for breakthrough. We just thank you right now in Jesus' name, just getting imparted right into their life in Jesus' name. And I just really feel over you, too, that there's, a, there's an anointing for you to raise up young musicians. You know, I really see just like uh, young guys coming around you and you're teaching them and you're training them. And you're raising them up and, and you're leading them. You know, there's, a, there's an anointing on you to teach. And in many areas, but I feel like particularly in the area of music, that you're going to teach people uh, how to play and how to sing and, and how to do this. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for that anointing just to come upon him. Lord, for a whole greater thing. In Jesus' name. And just upon you too, Christine. It is Christine, are you? Yeah. I just really saw, just as you were leading worship tonight, what the Lord really clearly showed me was that he's going to teach you uh, it's, it's like you're going to realize the power of the gift that God has given you and the power of worship. It's like you know the power of worship, but it's like you're going to see it with a whole new new way. And what I saw was almost like, imagine, you know, that you've got the Midas touch, you know, like you can touch something, it turns to gold. And you're like, oh my goodness, I've got power. You know, then you look around and go, what else can I turn to gold? You know, and you're like you're walking around and it's like literally I saw you actually taking the gift of worship that God had given you. And it's like you were going into different situations and going, man, I wonder if worship's going to work here. And things were changing and walls were falling and lives were changing because you had discovered different ways to use the gift of worship that God has given you. There's a breakthrough anointing on your life. When you lead worship, there's a breakthrough. There is, isn't there? Can't you? You feel it when she leads. There's like a, there, there's a breakthrough there, you know? And you're really going to see people set free. You've got a real desire for people to get healed in worship times, don't you? You know, you're crying out for that, haven't you? Yeah, so Father, I just thank you right now. Lord, we release that anointing for healing in worship times right now, God. Let it just begin to flow right out of your life in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, for in Harvest Church, Lord, that people will know that they just have to walk into the worship time and they're going to get healed. Amen. Lord, we thank you for people coming in off the streets and getting healed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Will God's people said? Amen. 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 Fantastic, guys. We have a seat. We will pray. And there's just a couple of other quick things that I just um, wanted to share tonight. When I was preparing... Um, what I often find is, as I pray, God will just give me pictures sometimes. And he gave me a picture, I believe, for your church. And what was interesting uh, was it kind of came all at once. And, and sometimes people say, how do you know when you're hearing from God? Everyone, anyone ever wondered that? You know, it's kind of like sometimes, you know, God's voice can kind of sound like your voice and you're not really sure which one's which. One of the ways you can know when God is speaking is what he does is he drops things whole package into your spirit. So if you're praying, and you don't just have the start of a thought, but you get like an entire thought that comes, boom, and it arrives all at once, chances are it's probably the Lord speaking to you. And anyway, what happened um, yesterday while I was praying for today, I got a, quite a clear picture, and I saw you guys. It was like you were driving a car, and you were driving down this ma massive highway. It was like a six-lane highway, and you know it was like full speed. And then what I saw was that you turned off the highway, and you turned onto this road, and this road took you off the highway and up into the hills, and you ended up at this big country house. And it was like huge, and it was ornate, and it was a place of rest and peace and growth, and there was just so much life all around that place. And what I really feel like for you guys is that as a church, you've been heading on a particular direction. I really feel like in, in so many ways, it's almost been like there's, um, there's been a similarity for you guys between uh, what God has placed on you and what God has placed on other churches. But I believe in this next season, you're going to begin to see the unique call that God has given you. And there really is, there's a unique call that is upon this church. And it's like you're going to get off the highway and off just where everybody else is going. And there's a new direction for you guys. Yeah, and it looks a little bit different. Amen. And you might look for a while and you think, man, I'm not sure about this because it's kind of heading off into a country road. And maybe, maybe we're going the wrong way because it feels like everybody else is going that way. But I tell you what, there was no mistake that was leading to a country house. Because when I saw the country house, what the Lord said is he said, that's a house for the country. It's a house for a nation. It's a house for a whole group of people. 
And I really believe that what the Lord wants to do in you guys is He wants to lead you on a particular path. And as you are, as you are faithful and as you follow Him, God is going to take you to a place where your house starts to have influence in the nation, in the country. Amen. Really is. So what I just really want to encourage you guys to do, you know, every church is different, amen? amen. And God has designed it to be like that. Like, I tell you what, I've just come back from an eight-week sabbatical. This actually is my first itinerant trip. This is my first itinerant engagement since coming back from my sabbatical. You guys are the number one. Yeah. yeah. And I'm having a good time tonight, haven't you? That's good. But you know what? I spent time in a whole bunch of different churches over that time. You know, I went up to Bethel Church. Anyone heard of Bethel? Yeah. Pastor Bill Johnson. Had a fantastic time there. Then I went to this little church in Sydney called Hillsong. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. <laughs> There's only, you know, a couple of people there, you know, one or two, you know, they've got a good heart, you know, they're, they're, they're doing something good. Right? That was phenomenal. So we went to the Hillsong Conference and every night 21,000 people packing that place out. Anyone ever been over to the Hillsong Conference before? No, never been? Seriously, you should go. It's, it's, it's amazing. And you know what? I went and I was able to visit a whole bunch of different churches and here's what I figured out by doing that. There's a number of things. Number one, God moves in so many different ways. You know what? You don't have to look like the person next to you. You don't have to try to be like the people around you. You know what I loved about all the different churches I went to? They were all so unique, but each one of them was so comfortable in their own skin. They just, they, they, would, they would get together and say, you know what? We love God, and we're going after the things that God has called us to do, and we're okay with that. And I tell you what, I think that the Lord wants to do that in this church as well. You know, I really do. I think he wants to do something on the inside of you guys where you guys look and go, you know what? We might be a little bit different from other churches, but we're Harvest Church and we're proud of it. We really are. We are. We are so excited. You know what I often say to my church? I say, this is the best church in the whole world. And my church goes, yeah. And, and you know what? I expect to have a stand-up fight with Pastor Stan over here because I'm going to say to Pastor Stan, my church is the best church in the whole world. And he's going to say, this church is the best church of the universe. <laughs> and you know what's right? It's right. I'll tell you what, I've got three wonderful kids. I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 9-year-old. And you know what? My kids are the best kids in the world. <laughs> They're awesome. They're more awesome than any other kids. But who else has got kids here? Yeah. Yeah? You got kids? Yeah? My kids are the best kids in the whole world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So here's the thing though. This is what God wants to do. He actually wants to make you proud to be his kids. And he wants to make you proud of the church that you're in. Because every family is different, every church is different, but I tell you what, we are all one under Jesus. Amen. Amen. And right across the world, God is doing amazing things in every single church. And we just get to be first, you know, uh, get a front row seat in these days of what God is doing across the world. It's so exciting, man. It's so exciting. So there's a whole lot of stuff. Anyway, I want to get on to tonight and just to, to preach now. What time do you need me to land? One o'clock in the morning. One o'clock in the morning? Yeah. You're serious, man. I can preach for a while. And you're going to regret that, eh? <laughs> anyway, no, I'm good. Okay. So um, when Stan uh, first spoke with me about uh, your message over the weekend, which is? Oh, yeah, that's so good, man. You guys all know that. Yep, so I'm, I'm guessing that, uh, that, that Pastor Wayne and Pastor Jason have both spoken on Wholehearted. And I'm third in line, so I'm really hoping that I'm not just going to say what they've already said. You know? I'm like, oh man, you know, like big third. It's kind of like they've, they've probably stolen all my stuff. So if you've heard this one before, it's actually because I stole Pastor, Pastor Wayne's notes this one. <laughs> just don't tell him, okay? And if I use the same jokes, just laugh, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. When, when, um, when Pastor Stan spoke to me and he said that your message uh, is going to be on wholehearted for the weekend, um, straight away the Lord took me somewhere. And if you've got your Bibles here, I want you to, to head to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Okay, that's where we're going tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 14. And this just dropped straight into my spirit. And I feel like it's a word for uh, the church and I feel like it's a word for this church. 1 Samuel 14. And just a little bit of a background to this. Anyone ever heard of a guy called King Saul? 
yeah, okay. That was King Saul. Good or not so good? Yeah, not so good. Eh? He kind of started out good and then uh, yeah, as he went along, it just wasn't so good. There's certain sports teams that are a little bit like that. <laughs> but anyway, the, what happens here in 1 Samuel 14 is that he, he's got this son called Jonathan. Every son, everyone say Jonathan. 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 Yeah. yeah. Go, go Jonathan. Awesome. Yeah, now Jonathan is, is a great young man. And anyway, uh, Israel under King Saul is at war with the Philistines and it's dragging on. And anyway, King Saul is sitting back and he's not in his palace, but he's close to his palace. And he's sitting there trying to figure out how to go beat the Philistines. And anyway, Jonathan and his armor bearer are just talking. And Jonathan's got this great spirit. He's just like, you know what? Let's go take him. Let's just go do something. Anyone ever just feel like, you know, it's just time to go do something for Jesus. You know, I mean, you can sit around and you can talk and you can plan, you can strategize, you can do, you can do all that sort of stuff. But at some point, someday, someone's just got to stand up and just got to get out there yeah. and do something. Yeah. Right? Yes. And Jonathan's that kind of guy. So anyway, here. Is he? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah. He's the best Jonathan in the whole world. Right over there. All right. So, here in 1 Samuel 14, this is a little bit of a background. So, we're going to read this now. We're starting from verse 1. And it says this, One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. That's not a pretext, by the way, kids, of not telling your parents stuff. <laughs> Just thought I'd put in there. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. And with him, there were about 600 men. And there's a bunch of guys who were there. And... We're going to go down to verse 6. And it says this, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps, he wants to say perhaps. Perhaps. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Isn't that a good word right there? Nothing can hinder the Lord by sa from saving, whether by many or by few. You know, how many people know that God doesn't need a whole lot to do a whole lot? Amen. Woo. He doesn't need to have masses of armies. He doesn't need to have tons of money. He doesn't need to have connections. He doesn't need any of that sort of stuff in order to do amazing things. In fact, what our God loves to do is He loves to take that which is least, and that which is small, and that which looks a bit broken, and that which looks a bit stuffed, and a bit wrecked, and not quite, and He loves to work through that sort of stuff. Because then everyone looks and goes, man, that has got to be God. Amen. Amen. That's why I'm standing up here preaching tonight. People look at me and go, man, seriously, if anything good happens, that's got to be God. When you preach. <laughs> so, here we go. It says in verse 7. Now, this is what his armor bearer says back to Jonathan. Jonathan says, hey, why don't we go over to the Philistine outpost? Let's go do something. You know, maybe the Lord's going to work. And his armor bearer comes back and he says, do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer says. Go ahead. I am with you in heart and in soul. I am with you in heart and in soul. And Jonathan said, come on then. We'll cross over towards them and let them see us. Now get this. How's this for a battle strategy? These guys are on the top of a hill. Like the Philistines, you know, they're all like armed to the teeth on the top of this hill. And here's Jonathan's strategy. They're down the bottom of the hill. These guys are at the top of the hill. And here's what Jonathan says. He says, now... If they say to us, wait there until we come down to you, then we'll say where we are. We're not going to go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we're going to climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Now, think about this for a moment. A bunch of really arms to the teeth guys at the top of a hill that you've got to climb up to reach. And Jonathan says, okay, here's how we're going to know if it's God. If they say, come up to us, then we know that God is moving. And I don't know, if I was the armor bearer at that point, I'd be kind of going, okay. You know what I said about heart and soul before? Just forget that. <laughs> you know, uh, you, can, you can do whatever you like, but I am no longer with you because I think this is a crazy battle strategy. But you know what? Anyway, the story reads on. And it says, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost in verse 11. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted down to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, okay, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Now there's got to be some faith right there. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
know, put your sword and everything on your back and climb up this cliff to these heavily armed guys because the Lord's given them into our hands. It's like, I don't know if I'm following at that point. But the armor bearer, what did he say? He said, do all that's in your mind because I am with you, heart and soul. So he climbs up afterwards. And then what happens? They get up. Jonathan climbs up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. And in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Now, here's the amazing thing. These guys climb up this hill. Worst battle plan you've ever seen in your life. They climb up, they get to the top, they probably get up near the top and they say, oh, oh mate, do you mind just giving me a hand? <laughs> Mr. Philistine man, just, just give me a hand just to get over there. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. You know? And these guys probably helped them up the last bit, just thought, man, we're going to slaughter them. We can give them a hand, no worries. You know? They let them up, oh, oh just, do you mind? I'll just, oh, just catch my breath up. Yeah, 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 no worries. No. Catches his breath. Okay, right. Now we fight. And that's it. And they slaughtered them. They completely devastated them. And this was the plan. You know, and it's an amazing thing, actually, if you read on later on in that chapter, what happened is because of the, the courage of those two men, people from all over Israel came out of hiding, and they all together went, and they devastated the Philistines. And you know what? It's a prophetic picture, too, because how many people know that in a church, it only takes maybe one or two people to start really standing up and saying, you know what? I'm going to live wholeheartedly for Jesus. And it has an effect on an entire church. Yeah. Just like that, you know? That's what the church needs today. It just needs some people of courage. Oh. Some men or women who are prepared to stand up and say, you know what? I've got a crazy battle plan, guys. I've, I've got something that's a bit mad, a bit crazy here. But I'm going to take this step of faith. I'm going to do something with this. And you know what? When they get success, it encourages everybody else. You know what? Your thing might be, maybe in your workplace, somebody's sick and you say, you know what? I'm going to pray for them. I'm just going to offer to pray for them. And you go pray for them and they get healed. And everybody else in the church gets encouraged and goes, man, it's happening for him. Yeah. It's happening for her. Or maybe you take the step to share your faith with somebody. Or maybe you take a step of faith and the Lord's given you, you know, an opportunity in business or something. And instead of sitting back, you say, you know what, I'm going to take that. I'm going to do it. Amen. And when you stand up and you begin to do that, then everybody else looks and goes, hey, it's working for them. Maybe it'll work for me as well. And the whole church can begin to stand up together. Come on. That's what I think the Lord wants to do in this day. But you know what? We're not just talking about being wholehearted. Because, you know, it's one thing to say that I'm wholehearted at the beginning of something, isn't it? Yeah. But then it's another thing to remain wholehearted when the rubber meets the road. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a church pastor. And later on this year, and at the start of next year, I think I've got about three or four weddings coming up. And I'm going to be marrying people. It was quite funny, actually. My, my poor daughter, you know, when she was a bit younger, you know, she cried at the dinner table one night because Dad was going to go and marry somebody. Oh. I said, oh, I'm, marrying, I'm, I'm marrying this person tomorrow. And he's like, no, no, you're already married. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 not like that, not like that. Yeah. So, anyway, I'm marrying a bunch of couples, and I tell you what, I'm so excited because on that day, you know, they're going to stand in front of me, and they're going to look into one another's eyes, and they're going to say, I do. And it's going to be an amazing moment of commitment between both of them. And it's going to mean so much for them. But how many people know that the wholeheartedness is not demonstrated in that moment? It's demonstrated in the weeks, in the months, in the years that follow that moment. When things are down. You know, when they're running short of money, when they're not getting on so well anymore. You know, when he tosses and turns all night in the bed and keeps her awake. <laughs> when he likes the room hot and she wants the room cold. You know, it's, it's worked out later on down the track. That's when you actually discover whether somebody is wholehearted. It's not in the moment of glory. It's in the moment of suffering. It's in the moment of pain. It's in the moments of difficulty that we discover that. And this, what I love about this particular story, and the reason I shared this one with you tonight, was that I, I actually feel like there's a picture within this picture. You see, Jonathan, in a way, represents Jesus, and we are like the armor bearer. You see, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, he said, hey, let's go over to Philistine outpost. Let's go do something. You know what? Jesus, over your life, he says, man, I want to do something great with your life. I want to take you, and I want to do some amazing things with you. I want to take those gifts and those talents that I've put on the inside of your life, and I want to do something with them. You know, see those giants that are around your life? Just go slay them. 
See those things that, you, those fears, those things that are standing over you? It's time for that stuff to fall down. That's what Jesus says to us, eh? He says, come on, come with me, come with me. We're going to go and do this. And it's so amazing that how many people seem to think that if they give their life to Jesus, or if they follow Jesus, he's just going to make them miserable. And some, some people don't trust God because they're like, man, if I put my life in his hands, if I actually go with him, oh, he's going to turn me into one of those boring, miserable Christians. You know? And I want to tell you the truth, man. Following Jesus is, is so far away from boring and miserable. We were, just, we were just talking about it at the dinner table tonight. You know, um, What was your name again? Aaron. Aaron, yeah. Aaron was just was just talking about. Um, we were talking in the conversation. He just mentioned about happy clappy churches, you know. And this is a happy clappy church, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm part of a happy clappy church. I tell you what, man. A million times, I'd rather be in a happy clappy church than in a boring, depressed, and dying church. Yeah. I'd rather be in a church with a bit of life than a church that's you know dying. But you see, this is the thing. Jesus said, "I've come that you might have life." And life to the fullest. And listen, friends, it's not just when you die, it's right now. Yeah. He wants to fill your life with life. He wants to take you on the greatest adventure you've ever been on in your life. He really does. This is what our God is like. This is what He wants to do. And He wants to do it in your life. He wants to do it in mine. So he, He's like, Jesus is like Jonathan. He says, hey, come on, let's go over to the other side. And He's not out to ruin your life. And But what we... Uh, what we do, our part in this whole thing, is the part of the armor bearer. Now, the armor bearer says two really interesting things. And if you look in your Bible, you can read them. The first thing that he says is he says, do all that you have in mind. Do all that you have in mind. Everyone say, do all that you have in mind. Now, that's a pretty big thing, right? I mean, imagine saying to another person, I give you permission to do absolutely everything that's in your mind. I mean, how much trust would you need to have in another person to say, I give you permission, they're looking and go, anything? <laughs> really? <laughs> but I tell you what, the armor bearer looks at Jonathan, he says, you know what? You want to cross over to the Philistines? You want to go do some stuff? You want to take us on a wild adventure? You know what? I'm with you. Do all that you have in mind. What Jesus is looking for is men and women like you guys, who when he says, hey, it's time to go over to the other side, we look back and we say, Jesus, you do all that you have in mind. Everything. But as you see, what, what happens though sometimes is that we don't say do all. What we say is do some of what you've got in mind. Yeah. I kind of like your plans, Jesus. I, I, I like certain parts of it, and I'm wondering if I can choose it a little bit like a menu, you know? We'll, we'll have the, uh, the blessing. Yes, that's good. I'll have that. Oh, the healing. Yep, yep. Totally. Uh, you know, financial prosper. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Gonna have some of that. Suffer. No, no, no none of the suffering. Uh, persecution. No, no persecution. Thank you. No, we don't want any of that. We go down all that stuff, but we won't have that stuff. So, what we say is Jesus says, hey, it's time to go to the other side. And we say, do some of what you have in mind. <laughs> Imagine that as the worship song. Lord, I give you some of my heart. I give you some of my soul. I partly live for you, oh God. Every third breath that I take, and maybe every fourth step that I make, Lord, you can sometimes have your way in me. It doesn't really, doesn't really work as a worship song, does it? And you know what? Unfortunately, that's often how we live our lives, though, because we, we won't give it fully over to the Lord. Why? Because we think if we put it in His hands, He's going to ruin it. He's going to wreck it. He's going to do something with it that we don't like. Now, listen to me. I just had my sabbatical, and that was like, that's not a holiday. What that is, is basically kind of like eight weeks of input, and it was so awesome, and I got some great input over that time. I had a bit of a holiday as well, but it was mostly input. But anyway, I'm quite a structured person. I'm a, I'm a very highly organized. I like lists. I like ticking things off my lists. Anyone following me? Yeah. Any other highly organized people out there? I like getting things done. You know, I, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one of those, you know, high A kind of people, right? You know, just like, I like things ordered. So when it came to my sabbatical, I had seven goals for my sabbatical. <laughs> And some people said to me, Peter, this is supposed to be a time of rest and input. You know, you're not supposed to have goals here. So I'm like, no, I've got my goals. Because you see, I knew what was best for my sabbatical. 
I did. <laughs> so anyway, I wrote down my seven goals and I felt really good about them. I'm like, yes, these are my goals for my sabbatical. This is what I'm going to achieve over this next eight weeks. It's going to be so awesome. Day one, I get down there to pray. And I enter into the time of prayer and I start to pray. And anyone ever had one of those moments where you just know God spoke and it just happened so quickly and it's like, it just came. He speaks, he speaks to me within the first few seconds that I start to pray. And this is what he says. I'm praying, you know, and I'm so excited because I've got my seven goals for my sabbatical. So good, right? And he prays and he goes, so, I see you have some goals for your sabbatical. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, no, 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 no. Don't you touch my goals. Because my goals are good. I made them up. <laughs> They're my goals. That's, you know, because I know what's best for my life, Lord. <laughs> you know, and you look at me going, well, that's terrible, but you do it too. All of us, don't we? It's like, we know what's best for our life, Lord. You know, it's like, Lord, you can have all of this. Just don't touch this. Lord, have my life. Just don't mess with my money. Come on. Yeah. You know, it's all tithing. Don't you swear on you. It's amazing how funny people get about money. You know what the Bible says? It says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is as well. You cannot, listen to me, I'm telling you straight up right now. You cannot say, Lord, I give you my heart without opening your wallet and putting that on the table saying, Lord, everything that's in that is yours as well. Do you understand that Jesus understands finances a little bit better than you do? He understands your money situation even better than you do? Come on. Do all that you have in mind, but don't touch my money. No, no, no. Do all that you have in mind, and, and here's my money. What about relationships? Oh, there's another one. Oh, Lord, I'll go anywhere you send me. I'll do anything that you ask me to do, but just don't get involved on the whole area. You know, if, if I like this girl or that guy over there, then that's kind of my business. You know, because I, you know, I know best. I'm a pretty good judge. I mean, how many people know that God knows us better than we know ourselves? Amen. How many people know that when God picks out a husband or a wife for you, He's not going to pick out some terrible, scungy, horrible, <laughs> yucky person that you, you know, it's not going to be like you look at them and it, 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 this hideous person walks up to you and then God speaks and He goes, yes, that's the person I love. <laughs> and yet, some people carry on like that. That's honestly what they think. They think if I give the area of my relationships over to Jesus, He's going to pick out some ugly, horrific person with bad breath and long toenails. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> I tell you, man, God is your Father, man. He wants the very, very best for you. You can trust Him with your money. You can trust Him with your relationships. You can trust Him with every area of your life. Lord, I give you my life, but don't touch my education. Hello. Lord, I'll, I will live for you, but before I live for you, I, I, I'm going to go to university. I'm going to do this degree, and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. How many of you have actually run that stuff past the Lord? So many people are actually just doing stuff because that's what everybody else does. How many people know that every one of you was made unique, which means that God has got a unique plan for each and every one of your lives. And when you put your life in His hand, He will take you far beyond anything that anyone could have ever done for you otherwise. Do all that you have in your mind is what the armor bearer said to Jonathan. And that needs to be our heart towards Jesus. That's being wholehearted people. When we look at Jesus and we say, Jesus, you do all that you have. You know what? I take every part of my life. I put it on the table in front of you. Lord, anything that you want to do, Lord, I'm there. I'm with you because I know that you've got the very, very best for me. I tell you what, man, God is so into you. I tell you what, you can trust him with everything because he loves you so much. Amen. He's not out to make your life a misery. He's out to bring life to your life. Amen. And if you would just take your stinking little fingers off your life for five seconds and actually just put it down in front of him and say, Lord, it's yours. I tell you what, he will take your little lump of clay and he will turn your life into gold. Yeah. Here's the alchemist from way back. He can do amazing things. When we will just put our lives in His hands and when we say, Lord, here it is, you know, heart and soul. So what does He say? He says, do all that you have in mind. And He says, I am with you. Everyone say, I am with you. I am with you. Heart and soul. Heart and soul. 
heart and soul. I mean, now that sounds like an emotion. That sounds like getting emotionally involved. You know, just today, I was at my, my youngest son that had a soccer prize given. And we sat in the hall for an hour and a half and watched people, you know, all these other kids get up and get prizes and people prattle on, you know, and every coach get up and blah, 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 about their team. And I'll tell you what, man, you know, you know how in prize games you have to clap, you know, after like, every, I can tell you, 95% of my clapping today was not wholehearted. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, a, a wholehearted, you know, there's, there's different kinds of claps. I'm going to put this out for a second. There's different kinds of claps, aren't there? You know, there's kind of the, uh, <laughs> or, or the, or the, you know, or there's the, you know what I'm saying? 95% of my clapping today, you know what, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't really interested in what was happening with the other, because I didn't know them, I didn't care about them. Really. <laughs> I didn't, I'm sorry, you know. I know that if you guys had all been there, every single person who got out there, you would have been wholeheartedly clapping for them. You're yeah. so much better than I am. But I'm, I'm just, a, I'm, just a, I'm, I'm an old sinner, you know. When my son got up though, when his team got up, I was clapping. That was wholehearted, man. I was in there. I was in the zone. But you see, because he had my heart and my soul. You see, and there's a huge difference when people start getting involved with God, not just committed to his plans, but saying, you know what, I'm going to become emotionally invested in him. I'm actually going to do this. You know what happens in a church? When people stop just coming to church and just rocking up and saying, okay, I'm going to be here you know, and Christine's going to lead some worship and I'm just going to, you know, sing my song and dance around a little bit, you know, just enough to kind of fit in, you know. <laughs> and then Pastor Stan's going to stand up, he'll take an offering, so, you know, I'll take my 20 cents out of my pocket and flip it in the <laughs> And then, you know, uh, and I'll hang around after church just long enough and I'll just say hi to a few people and then I'll go and I'll get on with my life, right? And unfortunately, in too many churches, that's actually how... A lot of people behave, but I tell you what, there's a huge difference that takes place when people say, you know what, heart and soul, my heart is in this place. When an entire church comes together, and when they say, you know what, we're not going to muck around any longer. We're not just going to go through the motions Sunday by Sunday. Because you guys are going to be doing this together for a long time. It's about time to say, to stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to get emotionally invested in this thing. I'm actually not going to give part of something to this, or a little bit of something to this. I'm going to give my life to this thing because it's worth it. You know what the Bible says? It says in, uh, I've got the verse, where is it? It's Psalm 127. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and you stay up late, toiling for food to eat, but he grants sleep to those that he loves. Listen to me. There is what God is building on the earth right now. Is He is building people, but there's something else that He's building. He is building churches. The Lord loves His church. He is not building bricks and mortar. He is building people together into a church. And I tell you what, if you call yourself a Christian, it's time to get on board with His plan. Yeah. And his plan is that you would not just rock up Sunday by Sunday and just go through the motions, but that you would heart and soul, that you would come in and say, you know what, I'm a part of this house, I'm going to live in this house, I'm going to give, and I'm going to bless every person who's in this house. I'm going to take the gifts that are on the inside of me and I'm going to pour them out for other people. Yeah. And together we're going to see what God can do in this house. Yeah. That's what God wants. You know what, when I think of my own church back home, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at what people in my church do from week to week and some of the things that they have to overcome in order to stay in that place of continuing to say, Lord, it's all for you. Because, I mean, how many people know at a time like this and a night like this, you know, we're all excited, right? That's good. You know, give a shout to the Lord. Come on. That's cool. And I tell you what, I think we need moments like this. Some people look and they go, oh, it's all just hype. <laughs> Tell you what, you can't overhype God. We could shout for the next 30 years and still not get close to the glory of God. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. You know what? I mean, this is the crazy thing. People say, oh, you know, it's shouting in church, you know, it's all a bit much. And then the same people go to the rugby. And they watch this little ball go from one side to the other. Like, <laughs> and then they come to church and like, mm -hmm. oh, I was all hyping. Come on, seriously, 
man. You cannot overhype God. You cannot overexaggerate Him. You know what? The angels and the elders have been trying for thousands of years. All that they can do, they just go, holy, holy, holy. And the elders take the crowns and they fly out. And, and you know what? He's got these creatures. Sorry. You're in the spray zone. You know what? You should read in Revelation. You understand that God's got creatures. He's got these four living creatures around the throne. And you know what? Here's, here's the wonderful thing about God. God made these creatures. He covers them with eyes. And they've got eyes all over them. They've got eyes on the front, eyes on the back, eyes on the inside, everywhere, right? They can't get away from the glory of God. You know, it's like he just created them. He goes, boom, here's my glory. They go, ah, oh, it's so much. And they turn around and they go, oh, my God. It's so Worship team's a bit excited today. <laughs> Pastor Stan, you know, he's making that pulpit a bit much, you know. <laughs> come on. I mean, this is what's going on in heaven. And by, the Bible says it's time for heaven to come to earth. Yes, and this is what Jesus does, man. He creates, if he creates these creatures with all of these eyes, just to blow their minds. Do you understand? That is their one purpose. For all of eternity, God created them for this purpose. He said, I'm just going to blow your mind for all of eternity. I've created with you with eyes, and I'm going to so delight you, and you're never going to be able to escape. That's, that's what God has created these creatures for. You know what? <laughs> he has created us for exactly the same purpose. Amen. Amen. Do you understand? I mean, I'm so far off my notes, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> do, you, do you understand? That God has created you to blow your mind for ages to come. Yes. How many people have ever been to an amazing concert? Yes. Like the best concert that you can ever imagine, right? Imagine you go along with this concert and it blows your mind. And then has anybody ever done something like that? And then you've gone back like maybe the same band was playing a second night. And the second night it just wasn't quite as good as the first. You know, it's kind of like there's something that happened on the first night. The second night was like, yeah. It was good, but it was, just wasn't. Do you know what heaven's going to be like? Heaven is literally like every night is better than the one before. Do you understand that the reason that God has created ages to come is He needs ages to show you all of His glory. Like you, we cannot fathom how amazingly awesome He is. You have been created by God to enjoy Him for all of eternity. That was what you've been made for. That's what you've been created. And that's why you can trust your life to this God. Because he says, you know, you give me, my, you give me your life. He said, I'm just going to blow your mind again and again. You're going to be the happiest person on earth. I'll tell you what, while we live on this earth, we're going to have times of trouble. We're going to have seasons of difficulty. And, you know, getting back on track now. When... <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. You know, I, I look at, there's people in my church that, and I tell you what, when I think about wholehearted, I think about some of these guys. You know, I think about my executive pastor, who actually, I'm, I'm preaching in this place tomorrow because he's actually crook. Like, he rang me on the way down here. He's, he was prepared for Father's Day and everything, and he's, he's actually sick tonight. But you know what? He's got three young kids. And how many people know that when you've got a young family, life is just full on? Yeah. You know, he's got three young kids. Man, he is teaching and preaching his guts out. Every moment of every day, man, he's pouring his life out for Jesus. You know, there is another lady in our church, and she's such an inspiration to me. You know what? She's struggling with a skin condition. And we keep laying hands on her and praying for her, and I know that God's going to heal her. How many people know that Jesus is in the healing? Yes. You know? We've got to keep praying. Sometimes we don't see the results straight away, but we don't give up. We just keep praying. We keep going back. But you know what? In the interim, you know what? She lies awake most nights. She can't sleep. Sometimes she'll get maybe two hours sleep a night. I mean, how many people know it's hard to survive on that? How many people need like 15 hours of sleep a night? Just the same. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why, you know, that's why it says there in Psalm 127 that sleep is a gift from God to those he loves, you know. He loves me some more. Anyway, the, but, you know, the amazing thing about this woman, man, I've seen people who've walked through less than what she is walking through, and they get angry and they get bitter and they say, well, God, I gave this for you and what have you given me and this is where my life is. You know what she does with the times that she's awake? 
She gets like two hours of sleep a night. You know what she does with the rest of that time? She prays, she listens to podcasts, and she gets prophetic words for people. And then she writes them on their Facebook wall the following morning. And she just goes out. And tell you what, man, when you talk to her, she is a woman who is wholehearted for God. One of our worship leaders, you know, she's an inspiration. She was uh, struggling with ME a number of years ago, you know, and chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, tired all the time or whatever, but you know what? She just took the little bit that she had and she gave it to Jesus. He started giving her more energy. Every time I see her now, you know, she is a living, te- breathing testimony to the glory of God, and she worships Him. I think of another young guy who takes two buses and walks a number of kilometers every single Sunday to come to our church. And he gets there before all the guys who have cars who live like three minutes down the road. Come on. Hello. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you know, that young man, that, those, that woman, those, those women, my, my executive, these guys, what they are demonstrating is wholeheartedness. You know, it's not just about the, the moment where it's all great. When it gets down to it, when it's hard, when it's difficult, that's when they rise up and they say, you know, Lord, do all that you have in mind because I am with you, heart and soul. Mm-hmm. You know, the rubber meets the road for each one of us. When in that moment of sickness, we say, Lord, do all that you have in mind. I am still with you, heart and soul. Mm-hmm. In the moment of depression, when you run out of money, where it doesn't look like God is providing the way that He's promised. Where you stand there in the middle of that situation, you say, Lord, you still do all that you have in mind because I am still with you, heart and soul. When people in the church hurt you, so many people give their faith away because they got hurt by the church. I got hurt by the church recently. I was praying downstairs in our, uh, in, in our events room, which is where some of you guys were for the MTCs. There's some big poles there. And I was... I, 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 I had my eyes closed as I do when I pray, and I walked into one of the poles. I got hurt by the church, man. The church really hurt me. It really did. Man, I was like, I was sore for days afterwards. But how many people know that it's, it's, it's very rare that the building will jump out and attack you? You don't generally kind of walk down the road and the church like comes like running behind you. You know? We don't tend to get that. The church is people. And how many people have worked out that Jesus is perfect, but some of the people who hang around him are not? Yes. <laughs> church is a place of broken people. Yes. And we hurt one another. And I'll tell you what, if you're part of this family or any family for long enough, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get wounded by other people in the church. It's just going to happen. But I tell you what, to be wholehearted says that even when I've been wounded by another person that I trusted, when I've been let down and my expectations were not met, in that moment, Jesus, do all that you have in mind because I am with you, heart and soul. Come on, come on. And I'm not going to give up my faith because I was offended by somebody else. I'm not going to let it go. You know what? Just to give you a little bit of brief history as I come in for a landing now so you can... Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I, I was brought up in a Christian home, and, but I really got on fire for the Lord when I was 15 years old and I met the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what, man. The reality of God changed my life massively. I mean, I always knew that God was real. But when he showed up in my bedroom when I was 15 years old, and I hit the floor and I was laughing and crying, and I didn't even know what had hit me. And I went to school the next day, and the people at school, before I'd even opened my mouth, they looked at me and said, what has happened to you? And I said, man, here's what you've got to do. I took some of them down to the church, prayed for them. Some of them got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some of them, you know, just said, come, say, come Holy Spirit. So they said, they go, come Holy Spirit. And I'm like, no, you're not saying it right. It's having some feeling. Come Holy Spirit. No, 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 like, come Holy Spirit. <laughs> so some of, these, some of these guys got massively touched by the Lord. Some of them didn't. But I tell you what has been interesting. I've been a Christian for quite a while now. And I've been in some tremendous altar calls. And I've been in some tremendous times where God's Spirit has moved so powerfully. I remember one situation in a camp that was a little bit like this one. There's about 100 young people packed into a room. And we just finished this time of worship. And the guy who was preaching got up and he put his Bible down. And he had his message and everything prepared for the night. But there was just a sense of the God in the room. And everyone's standing up. And he said, you know what? Why don't we just pray? And he says, come Holy Spirit. And you know what happened in that room? I've never seen anything like it before or since. Not to this extent. Within three seconds, without any person laying hands on anyone... The entire lot of that room hit the deck. There's like maybe three people left standing going, what the heck just happened? 
And for the next three hours, man, demons came out of people, healings broke out. It was, it was all on. Man, I've seen some amazing stuff. And I've seen the power of God demonstrated in some incredible ways. I tell you what, here's for real. But you know what breaks my heart? And that, that is this, that there was a whole lot of people my age who all stood in conferences and we said, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. And we said, you know, Jesus, you do all that you have in mind. I'm with you, heart and soul. We gave our life to him. And we said, you know what? We've tasted something. We're never going back. We're going to live this thing out. And you know what? Some of those friends today, they're continuing to walk strong with God. They're leaders in business places. They're leaders in their families. They're leaders in the churches. Some of them are pastoring churches. But you know what? There's other ones. And they're not walking with God anymore. Because what happened was that in the hard moment, in the difficult moment, when it got a bit tough, they looked and they said, you know what? I don't know if God's still around anymore. You see, the only difference long term was that the first group stood and they said, you know what? Like Job said. How many people know Job in the Bible? He had a bit of a difficult time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just a little bit, you know. <laughs> bit of a bad day there, you know. But in the middle, he utters this most profound statement. He says this. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And I'll tell you what, it is not the purpose of God to slay you. It is not the purpose of God to wreck your life. But I tell you what will keep you in the game long term is the attitude that it's like, even if it looks like the Lord is dealing me a bad hand, yet I will trust Him. Even if it doesn't look like He is for me, even if it's looking like my life is maybe going off track, maybe I'm struggling with something that I didn't think I'd have to struggle with. Maybe I've been let down. Maybe I've been hurt by somebody. Maybe I'm going through some sickness or some difficult patch. But in the middle of that thing, I'm going to continue to say, Lord, do all that you have in mind because I am with you, heart and soul. Amen. Continually. And that's what will keep us in. And finally tonight, you know, uh, the Bible says about Caleb, and I'm sure this one's come up. Has this one come up? It's got to. It's like, it's, it's, it's wholehearted. In the book of Numbers, the Lord said of this, of, of Caleb, he said, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and because he follows me wholeheartedly, here's the promise of God, I will bring him into the land and his descendants will inherit it. Wow. Because he has a different spirit and because he follows me wholeheartedly, I'm going to bring him into the land and his descendants will inherit it. Let me translate that to today's <laughs> lingo, okay? You guys have got a different spirit, I can tell even by being around you. You know, there's a different heart here. You know, you're not like your friends, you're not like the people maybe you spend most of the week with. There's hope that's on the inside of you. The spirit of God is on the inside of you. You've got a different spirit. I can sense it even while we're here in the meeting tonight. I know. There's a different spirit that's on you. And what Caleb had was he had the different spirit, but he had something else as well. Because he said, I'm going to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And because of those two things, yeah, are you going to come play? That would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Choice. I love this. Because of those two things, he said, I will bring him into the land I've promised. You know what? God will bring you into all that you have, he has promised you. If you will follow him wholeheartedly and if you will keep that different spirit. And not only that, friends, but get this too. And his descendants. What does that mean? Every single one of you guys is leaders. You are all leaders. You might not feel like a leader, but you are a leader because you've got influence somewhere in the world. Amen. And I'll tell you what, when God brings you into your promise, you're going to begin to affect everybody else around you and they're going to walk in their promise. You know what? It's so important that each one of you guys becomes the person that God is calling you to be. You know why? It's not just about your life. It's about all the lives that are depending on you to touch them. You know what? There's people who are sick at the moment and God wants to raise you up with healing power because he wants to set that person free. So we have to stand up and become those people that God has called us to be. Otherwise, there's others who are going to stay in bondage. Do we, do we see that? Amen. It's not just about our life. There's actually something that's bigger at stake. You've got to stop seeing yourself as just one person and saying, oh, you know, I'm just pathetic little me. I'll tell you what, man. God wants to take you in your situation, in your life, and he wants to work through you to touch and to change the lives of everybody around you in your vicinity. It's not just about your life. It's about the lives of every single person that you're going to touch. Aren't you guys glad that Pastor Stan and Helen stood up and became the people that God called them to be? Yes. 
We wouldn't be sitting here tonight and doing that if these guys had not been obedient, right? Let me ask you a question. What is it in your world that's not happening yet because you're still sitting down? What is it in your world that's not moving yet because you've not actually crossed over to the place where you said, Lord, I'm going to be wholehearted for you? How many people are sitting around your life and they actually need a breakthrough and it's time for you to stop mucking around with God and actually stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to live this thing. I'm going to do this. I'm not just going to rock up to church and go through the motions week by week. You know what, I'm going to get my heart and my soul in this thing. I'm going to do this together. We're going to see Harvest Church become everything that God has called it to be. And we're going to see God move through this place to touch the lives of so many people. And I tell you what, that's what God wants, amen? amen. That's what He's looking for. And I know that, you know, that's when we start to come into the land of promise. I believe that God's got great plans for this church. I really do. And here's the last thing I'm going to say before we pray. In the book of Chronicles, there's a guy called Solomon, the son of David. And Solomon had this amazing vision from God. Maybe you've heard about it. Where God came to Solomon. He said, Solomon, what do you want? Do you remember that? Yes. And Solomon asked for something. Do you remember what he asked for? Wisdom. That's right. And, and the Lord said, you know what? I'm going to give you wisdom. You, didn't know, you could have asked for riches, a long life, all this other stuff. You're going to get all of that. You're going to get wisdom. I mean, wouldn't you love an encounter with God that actually, um, where it was like the Lord rocked up to you and looked at you and said, what would you like? I mean, isn't that, that's a pretty amazing encounter, don't you think? What people miss, though, is what happened directly before that encounter. You know what happened immediately before he had that dream? What happened was that he sacrificed a whole lot of animals. The Bible said that he sacrificed 1,000 bulls. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of animals. Right? But you know, after that, that huge sacrifice that he made, it broke him through to something and the Lord rocked up to him and he said, what do you want? Because there was this outpouring of wholeheartedness from Solomon towards God. And then God turned around and said, listen man, you've got my attention. What do you want? You see, here's the thing. Sometimes we stop at 10 bulls. Right? You know, we start down the track and we say, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. And we, we, we do it for a little bit. And it's like 10 bulls or 100 bulls. How easy it would have been to stop at 368? 547? 793 bulls? But he went the whole way. He sacrificed a thousand. Huge amount of sacrifice. But he just, but you know what that was? That was an outpouring of Solomon's heart to God. He said, Lord, I give you everything. I lay it all down. Everything I've got is yours. And you know what? After he did that, that's when God walked up to him and said, 